do anywhere in the brain. You can turn things off or on as you wish, as long as you know the locations. And the other final piece of this sort of optogenetics puzzle is there's uh, a fluorescent protein called GCAMP, um, which is sort of like a GSP, but with a uh, calmodulin attached to it. And the calmodulin binds calcium ions, and the GSP is a green fluorescent protein. But when the calmodulin isn't bound to a calcium, it sort of hangs out here and disturbs the conformation of the GSP so that it can't correct. But when this binds a calcium, then the GSP fluoresces green. And calcium is one of the major signalings for uh, neuron firing, uh, especially for neurotransmitter release. You need an influx of calcium. So this basically tells you whether the neuron is active. And as if that weren't enough, because it is a second messenger, um, just this year, there is a protein developed that's a, a membrane protein, gen also genetically encoded. All of these can be just engineered into a line of animals, and then you don't need to worry about it anymore, no injections or anything. Um, so there's, there's another one that originally, nature intended this as a proton pump. Um, it's archaeorhodopsin, it's a light-sensitive proton pump. But what they were able to do is to silence the proton pumping, basically to disable the, that aspect of the protein's function. But then they, dis they discovered that it actually then has a fluorescence, which is proportional to the voltage across the membrane that it would be moving those protons across. So in sum, you can activate neurons, you can inhibit neurons, you can measure the calcium concentration for activation, and you can measure the voltage, and you can do it all anywhere you want very fast. Uh, so this is basically a toolkit for doing experiments that you could really only dream of with electrophysiology. Um, in particular, the one that I'm working on right now is uh, the worm, C. elegans, which is a very well-studied organism. And in fact, it's the only organism for which we actually know the complete uh, connectome. So a lot of people talk about connectomes and it's sort of a dark secret of neuroscience that we already have the connectome for C. elegans and we can't do anything with it. Because it, it turns out that just knowing where, you know, you have one neuron here and its synapses to this neuron here and this controls the body wall muscles, that doesn't really tell you anything like, well, maybe this is an inhibitory synapse, maybe it's excitatory, maybe it's non-functional, maybe it's stronger than the other synapses on that cell, maybe it's weaker. And so it, it basically gives you very little information to start from if you're trying to understand how this organism thinks or computes. But since we know where all the neurons are, and there are only 302 of them, it's not crazy to think about using this microscope and these biophysical techniques to actually build a model uh, pairwise, if need be, all 90,000 pairs of how every neuron uh, affects the behavior of every other neuron. So that's what I'm working on. Um, I think that actually doing these sorts of observations is something that's never really been done before. And again, to make a ridiculously grandiose comparison, it's kind of like how Newton only was able to do what he did because of Galileo developing the tools to observe phenomena that had never been seen before. And I think that um, advances, uh, well, this is actually a quote from, from Sidney Brenner, who is the first person to suggest that you can study this worm and maybe learn something from its nervous system. Um, advances in, sci in science usually come from uh, new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas in that order. And so now we have the techniques, we're working on the discoveries, and the hope is that it will lead to new ideas. So 